Hey guys, today we're gonna to talk about five live stream lighting mistakes that I see people make all the time. Now, I've reviewed thousands of live streams of different churches, and while these tips are really for the live stream, this can apply for your in-the-room lighting as well. So I'm standing here in our worship center. You can see we've got a lot of stuff going on, but there's some things that I've learned and mistakes I've made along the way that I wanna pass along to you. So the first one is, before you dive into any of this kind of cool lighting that you see on the stage, you need to make sure that your key lighting for lighting the people on the stage is set correctly. One mistake that I made early on that I see a lot of churches doing is mixing different types of fixtures that have different white balances to do your key lighting of people. Maybe you grab some new LED RGBW par cans, and then you add those in with some of your old conventional Source 4 fixtures that are kind of your ellipsoidal style lights. Well, now you've got 3200 Kelvin mixing with 5600 Kelvin, maybe even worse, and your skin tones on camera can get really messed up. And so don't use RGBW fixtures or even RGBAW fixtures, that's amber and white. If you're gonna go LED, make sure that you get variable white temperature fixtures that you can either match with your existing stuff or replace everything and just get the same Kelvin temperature LED lights so you can set your cameras to their correct white balance. Along with those key lights, a lot of times people are just underpowering those key lights or they're doing the opposite and overpowering and not shuttering off to just keep the light on the stage. You can see we have a giant projector screen on our stage, which I've made a video about, it costs us $600 to make, 26 feet wide. But we have no lights pointing and hitting that screen. We're using ellipsoidals that are just, they have little you know barn door type things inside of the fixture so you can really shape the light. What you don't wanna do is get a bunch of par cans and just wash out your whole stage. Really direct that light to where you want it so that way your other fixtures and projection walls can actually shine through and cut through the mix. Another mistake that we made early on was you can see we have a big black curtain that's on the back of our stage and we had no lighting behind anyone. And that's a mistake I see all the time is the lack of backlights. Whenever we black out our stage or put curtains up or have a really dark background and then people wear black clothing like I usually do, uh, you become a floating head if you don't have any light coming from the back to help separate you from that back wall. And so that really will help take especially your live stream and your camera shots, uh, give them that extra bit of dimension. And so if you don't have any backlights, that's a really important step that I would encourage you to take. Now backlights do not have to have that same color temperature. You can mix a little bit of color in there if you'd like to, but don't go crazy. Don't, you know, line people with uh, a weird lime green color for your whole worship set. And if you need backlights, you can go a lot of directions. My favorite fixtures to use are the $300 Boulder Pro variable zoom pars. You can mount these wherever you want, floor or ceiling, and then be able to do some different looks, different colors and shape that light without just being stuck with just one spot of light for your backlight. So I'll link those in the description. The third mistake that I see all the time is just bad color theory. You get all these fixtures on your stage, maybe you're washing your walls with color, but then you know, the lighting director feels the need to just utilize everything all the time and maybe over utilizing those. Uh, multiple different colors at the same time, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And so our rule of thumb typically is that we usually are sticking to two main colors if we're not doing one solid color and that's usually based off of our on-screen content. Now you can throw a third color in there as kind of that tertiary third extra kind of flavor to the mix. Very rarely are we doing any color scrolling or rainbowy kind of patterns unless it's very purposeful. And so really try to stay away from that and only use those big effects and strobing stuff when it is really super necessary to emphasize what you're wanting to say. Color communicates, and we can utilize color to help tell the story that we're telling through the music as we worship together. So we rarely start our service with a red or a really intense kind of feeling like that. Usually we're more on the blues, purple, teals spectrum of colors just because that's really more inviting, but use color in the right way to help communicate what you're trying to do with the worship set as a whole. Mistake number four 
is you get an LED wall and then you don't have sufficient key light to balance your screen content for your cameras. When you're balancing all of these different light sources for your live stream, you gotta consider that. And so most people that are getting LED walls need to have the ability to bring the brightness down from what I've heard from other guys to like between 10 and 25%. And even then you're gonna have to have a lot more key light to balance that out. For us, our key light is not super bright. So our projection on camera actually looks really bright and vibrant. But if we were to have a lot more key light, then you know our on-screen content on camera would look a lot dimmer. And so all of those things have to kind of work in tandem for on screen the cameras to present the different light sources, you know, at their best viewing points. So that's just something to consider, especially as we dive further and further into the LED wall territory. And the fifth mistake I see is not necessarily lighting, but it's the haze in the room. So many people think that if they just buy some fixtures, I made the same mistake. I bought some movers and we were using them just gobos on the wall. And then I realized you can't even see the beams without haze, right? So then you go out and you buy a cheap hazer. And that's the first mistake that people make doing haze. They, they go out and buy the cheapest hazer and it's usually more like a smoke machine type thing. And it puts out really cloudy stuff. And if your church has never done haze before, that's just gonna immediately put them off towards the idea of haze because it's gonna smell weird. It's gonna be really thick and cloudy, but not evenly distributed. So for us, we use an Ultratech Radiance hazer that we've loved. I think it's about $1,000. We figured out the levels and the fan positions for all those different things to kind of disperse the haze through our room to where it's really natural feeling and the beams go out far enough. But then by the time preaching gets 10 minutes in, most of the haze is kind of dissipated, which is one of the benefits of the Ultratech over some of the oil-based hazers uh, that are also great, but just have a long hang time, which can be good, but they're usually more expensive as well. So there you go. There's five mistakes that I've learned or I've seen. Let's do our best to uh, use our lighting as what they are called, instruments. Use the light as an instrument. When you're the lighting director, you're that concert director that's telling all the different you know, pieces of the orchestra to function in a different way. And if they're all playing at forte the whole time, it's gonna have some listener fatigue. And the same thing can be said visually. So just use the instruments the best way that you can. Remember guys, we do a lot of great things. Let's do it all for God's glory. We'll see you in the next one.